Hello, and welcome to Building Multiplayer Simulations with Stella Architect. My name is Billy Schoenberg, and I'll be leading you uh, through today's webinar. Uh, so before we get started, um, let me introduce myself just a bit. Um, I'm a uh, engineer here at uh, IC Systems. Uh, my area of responsibility covers uh, pretty much everything having to do with uh, interfaces and interface development. Um, and I'm really happy today to be uh, showing you guys uh, how we can put together uh, multi-user simulations. This is a pretty neat technology which you could use um, for all sorts of learning purposes and also it tends to be pretty fun uh, as a participant. But before we get really into it, what I want to do is just cover a couple of webinar mechanics with you. For those of you who aren't familiar with GoToWebinar, um, GoToWebinar has a grab tab that you can use to show and hide the panel. Um, we will be having a Q&A session uh, at the end of today's webinar. Um, so if you have any questions, type them in um, and we will collect them all. We'll try and answer as many of them as we can on the air today. Those which we can't answer on the air, we will send out uh, responses via email. Um, in uh, the accordion is a set of controls for audio to make sure that, uh, that you can hear me. So without much ado, let's get into today's agenda. And so it looks pretty short, you know, only four bullet points, but trust me, um, there's a good bit of, of meat in today's presentation. The first thing is a primer on multiplayer terminology. So I want to get you up to speed on what the vocabulary is so that you can kind of understand the concepts um, that I'll be talking about. From there, we'll actually go ahead and build a multiplayer game. Um, and we'll do that using uh, the interface window in Cello Architect. And then finally, um, we'll cover testing multiplayer games, which is actually pretty interesting because, uh, well, how do you pretend to be multiple different people? Um, and then finally, uh, like I said, we'll leave about 15 minutes at the end uh, for questions and answers. So let's start with that terminology. Um, and there's three key terms. The first one is role. The second one is team. And the third one is game. So let's start with role. So we use roles to identify information that players have access to. And so by information, I mean what decisions a player can make and what outputs a player can look at. Um, so it's very important as a multiplayer game designer, which hopefully you all aspire to be, to make decisions about what information each one of your players has access to. Because when building multiplayer games, really the key dynamics that are generated tend to not come from the model itself, but through feedback loops which flow through the users. And the best way to get the most interesting multiplayer games is to have really good role design. Where, for instance, if we were building a simulator of government, you know, the president, you know, might have uh, control over, um, you know, accepting the budget, you know, but uh, the secretary of defense might have control over how the uh, military budget is allocated internally. So it's important to decide what outputs and what decisions are visible to which people. So that's what a role is. The next uh, keyword is team. Um, and so a team is a group of players who all interact in a single game. So a team are all of the players, um, each with one and only one role, who through their actions, create a shared simulation run. So teams uh, in multiplayer speak don't necessarily have anything to do with being competitive or cooperative. A team just refers to a group of players who all have one and only one role who interact together to create the simulation run. Finally, uh, we have the word game which is what we call a single run of the model which the team creates together. Um, so uh, let's again go back to that little government simulation. You know, let's say we had three roles, president, vice president, secretary of defense. Um, that's clearly a competitive, uh, a cooperative, excuse me, cooperative uh, uh, team. But again, there's still a group of players who all have roles who are all going to interact together to create a single simulation run or game. Um, you, we could have a team that is competitive. You know, for instance, we're going to do that today. We're going to build a, uh, a price war game where we've got uh, two or three players bidding um, in a market. So, you know, the company A and the company B, they're both um, on the same team, even though they're competing with each other. 
So let's keep these words in the back of our head um, while we uh, get started with Stella Architect. And so what I've brought up now on the screen is the interface window of Stella Architect. And I've preloaded a model um, which already exists, which I already wrote. Um, and uh, this model is a pretty simple um, arrayed model, um, but multiplayer games do not have to be arrayed. Uh, multiplayer games can be based on top of any model. In this case, it was just easier for me to make it a raid, so I did. Um, in this uh, model, we have you know our typical standard Bass Diffusion model, where we've got a stock of potential customers who flow into three stocks of actual customers. Um, in this case, our roles are specified by our arrays. So in this case, we have one array dimension company. There are three companies. The first company is Widgeroo. The second is Fandangled. The third is Thingamabob. Um, they all have control over a decision called price. And by setting the price, we determine what the product attractiveness is. And based upon the product attractiveness, we determine what the indicated market share is. Based upon the indicated market share um, and how long it takes you know, to, for the market to adjust, um, we adjust the purchases. So that's how this model is put together. So let's go back to the interface and actually get started putting it together. So the first thing that we do when we're building um, an interface is uh, we think to ourselves, um, who's going to use my interface and what kind of device are they going to use my interface? And um, we do that so that we can understand, you know, at what page size we want to make our simulation and so that we can think about how we want to design it. In this case, I'm imagining, you know, our customer base, uh, you know, for this game is probably going to use it on, you know, laptops or, or maybe some tablets, things um, that have a more modern widescreen ratio. So I'm going to come to the page size setting here in the interface settings panel, and I'm going to adjust it to be wide desktops and tablets, which will adjust my page size uh, to be 1066 by 600. Um, I do this before I start um, so that uh, as I design all of my content, I design it to fit the page. Um, I try not to type custom numbers in here. The settings that we give you uh, tend to work on, you know, 90 to 95% of screens. Um, you know, use the custom settings kind of at your own risk. Um, and your risk there is designing a sim that really only works well on your screen. For instance, you know, let's say you have a giant monitor. If you design your sim to be 3,000 pixels by 2,000 pixels, well, on everybody else's monitor, they're going to be scrolling all over the place. Alrighty, so enough about uh, page size. Let's actually get into putting this simulation together. So all simulations start with, you know, the key building blocks, which are input devices, output devices, and devices which are capable of performing actions. Multiplayer games are no different. So let's start by building this multiplayer game um, as a single player game. And so to do that, um, what we're going to do is we're going to put down a graph and click once on the graph tool and click again on the canvas to place it down. And uh, on this graph, um, we want to plot uh, the variable market share. So I'm going to hit the add new series button, which is the green plus. Anytime you see one of those green pluses, it means put a variable in this device. It brings up a filter list that I can type directly into, um, and I'm looking for the market share variable, and I want to plot market share of all three companies. So you'll see now that the market share is being plotted, um, and I'm using a line graph. Um, I don't actually think a line graph is appropriate for this kind of data. It'd be much better to use a stacked area graph so we can see which portion of the market is controlled by who. So now that we've set that up, um, let's go ahead and set up our legends appropriately. So let's get market share out of the legend, and let's call the first one Widgeroo. Um, and click again on the item in the series list and click in this legend title box and type in Fandangled. And third is Thingamabob. And you can see as I do this, the, uh, the interface canvas is updating automatically. Um, we have a what you see is what you get um, interface design principle. So let's change the title of this graph um, to be market share. And so now we've got uh, the graph set up. Um, let's get it uh, aligned nicely on the page. And so let's move it here and make it a heck of a lot bigger. I'm actually going to close the panel by hitting this gray triangle so I can see what I'm doing. And now we can get uh, this graph um, to be pretty wide. 
um, and pretty easy to read. Excellent. If I double click on this graph, it's going to bring the panel back open for me so that I can continue editing. I want to create a new graph, um, uh, but rather than uh, you know copying and pasting, I want to build it uh, in a tab navigator. So I'm going to hit uh, the green plus, which will add a new graph. And you'll see here that there's this box which says pages. If I open it up, I can have them set up in tabs or in a drop down. And in this case, I want tabs. So that makes my graphs nicely tabbed um, so that people can uh, easily flip through them. On this graph, um, I want to plot the key metric um, that individual users are trying to maximize, which is profit. So I'm going to add a new series, and I'm going to do profit. And I'm going to do profit for all three companies. And we're going to, again, do the same thing that we did before with the legend titles. So we'll adjust this legend title to be Widgeroo. We'll adjust this uh, legend title to be Fandangled. And we'll adjust this one to be Thingamabob. Okay. Excellent. So now we've got uh, our profit graph somewhat set up. Um, let's go ahead and set up uh, the title to say profit. And then uh, let's go ahead and uh, on each one of these series, let's mark keep zero visible um, so that our profit always has a zero baseline. Excellent. Um, now we can actually format uh, the values on this graph by right clicking on it and hit format multiple. And we're going to select all three profit variables, and we're going to change them to display as currency, um, and we're going to keep um, the auto precision and the scale by auto. And so now we end up with dollars um, on our left y-axis, which is exactly what we want. All right, so now we've got our market share and our profit set up. Um, and what I'm kind of building towards is we're going to take this content that I'm putting here. First, we're going to put um, an input device in. Then we're going to put in a button to actually simulate. And I'm setting this up so that we can copy and paste each page um, onto um, a page that is for each specific role. And all we'll do is adjust the content that is visible to each role to be relevant and important um, to each role. So let's continue um, by creating input devices. Um, to do that, um, we're going to use a numeric input device. So all of our input devices are up here in the build toolbar. Um, and we have things like sliders and knobs and switches and um, radio buttons and even a draggable pie chart. But in this case, all I really want is just the ability to type in a price um, for my widget. So I'm going to select the numeric input, and I'm going to select again to place it down. And I'm going to get it fairly well aligned um, to the left edge of the graph. And I'll double click to bring open the panel. And you'll see our good friend here, the green plus, which means put a variable in this widget. And in this case, the variable I want to put into this widget is the variable price. In this case, I can't use the star because the numeric input device is only capable of, of showing data for a single um, variable. Whereas graphs and tables and, and whatnot are capable of displaying data for multiple variables. So I can choose a star to show data for every single option. Here, I can only choose one. So I'm just going to choose Widgeroo. And uh, we're going to update um, this um, numeric input device um, with a title. We'll just call it price. Actually, we'll call it Widgeroo price. And we'll leave the input with alone. And now we've got that set up. Next, what we need is a button. Uh, we need the button to actually run the simulation. So uh, we click the button item um, in the upper left hand corner of the screen. And we click again to place it down. And I'm just going to get it aligned uh, fairly close. And I'm going to make it uh, a bit bigger. And you see here, I get these nice blue alignment guides, which help me get my sim all lined up next, uh, uh, you know, onto a grid with itself, so that all of my widgets um, are nicely uh, aligned. So what I want to do with this button, and so let's just scroll over here so that we can see the button as we edit it, is I want this button um, to simulate the simulation in little tiny steps. So what I want to do is I want to use the action advanced time in ballistic mode. So advance the time um, by one time unit or two time units or 
however many time units. Um, in this case, I want two because this model runs over 12 months. I only want people to advance the model six times, meaning they're setting their price once every six months. So I set the time to two. Um, you'll see that the button label automatically updates based upon the first action in the list of actions that a button is performing. Um, we could change that if we wanted to, but uh, I like the word advanced, so I'm going to leave it. What I do want to change, though, is the look and feel of this button by going to the style panel, which is clicking the paint roller um, at the bottom of the panel. Um, you'll notice that anytime you see that paint roller, it means set the styles. I want to adjust the styles of this button so that it has a flat background and so that the background color is green. Once I've done that, I want to adjust um, the font to be larger, so it's more easily red, and I want to adjust the font color from black to white. Once I've done that, I now have a nice green, you know, pleasing button, which uh, people can use to advance the simulation. So let's go ahead and save our work before we test out how it all works. So let's go to File, Save As, and I'm going to just drop this here on my desktop as Price War. Now, um, with Architect, um, it's useful if you save your work, obviously, um, but you don't have to rely on it like you did in the past. If um, in some unforeseen circumstance, Stellar Architect does stop working, um, we do save a copy of your file in the background once every three minutes or so. Um, and we represent to you that uh, file as a crash recovery in the event that uh, Stella unexpectedly quits. Um, so you don't have to be as um, pedantic about saving your work um, constantly. We do save it for you in the background. So now that we've got our simulation kind of mocked up, Let's go ahead and use uh, the presentation mode button over here. And in this case, I'm going to do present windowed, um, which gives me a preview of my simulation at a screen size um, that uh, is exact to what I specified as my page size. So this is what actually 1066 by 600 looks like on this screen. Um, so what I can do is I can advance the model. I can set a price. So we'll set $15 here, advance the model. We'll set, uh, we'll go back to our market share. We'll set this to 12. We'll advance. And uh, everything is working as we expect. All right. So now that we've got our single player interface set up, um, let's begin to do some of the work um, to add a title bar and a mast and all of that. And then we'll begin to split this up for multiplayer. So the first thing I want to do is go at, uh, into the templates. And I want to create a page template that I'm going to use um, on all of my simulation pages. The first thing I want to do is put down a text box. And that text box is going to display the title, Price War. And so I'm going to select that text box. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and set up uh, my font settings um, in this text box by opening the panel using the gray triangle coming here and pushing the font size to be quite large. So let's try 36. And uh, I want to change the font style um, to, to look a bit uh, better. So uh, let's try uh, century. Uh, let's see here. Sorry. We've got a lot of fonts to choose from. Uh, the one that I was going for in this case is Century Gothic. Um, and I want the font size instead of 36 to be 48. There we go. And uh, let's get this up at the top of the page. The next thing I want to do is put in an image um, to act as a logo. So I'm going to click once in the graphics item and once again to place it down. I'm going to click on the settings wrench to get back uh, to the settings for this widget. And I'm going to import the image from a file. And the file is uh, located here in my list of folders um, for the webinar. And what I want to do is I want to size this uh, image uh, to the frame, but I want to maintain its aspect ratio. So I can get um, this Price War logo set up. Let's uh, adjust that. I'm going to use the arrow keys to nudge it around, um, which is useful for making small movements. 
I'm going to take this and I'm going to use the shift arrow keys to move um, widgets in larger increments um, to kind of get everything lined up the way I want to see it. Now um, we're going to import another image to act as an underbar, a divider between the title bar content and uh, the rest of uh, the sim content. So I'm going to go again to the image, import from file, and we're going to grab the line. And we'll take this line and we're going to get it set up so that it's uh, underneath uh, the price war. And uh, what we want to do is get that set here. Excellent. That looks really good now. So now we've got uh, our title bar masked more or less set up. So if we come back uh, to our interface by going to the context interface, I can then choose to use this template and now this content will appear on this page. So now we've got a pretty good looking sim um, which uh, shows my market share and my profit and lets me set price and advance time. So let's go through the process now of making this a multiplayer game. To do that uh, I'm going to double click on the page to bring up my interface settings panel and I'm going to make a couple of adjustments. The first thing I want to do is uh, set this page up as my widget root page. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to name each one of the pages in the simulation um, for each one of the three companies. And I'm going to set it up um, so that each company has their own page. When you're building multiplayer games, you can have um, each of the different roles share pages or use um, pages which are distinct in and among themselves. That process is up to you as a simulation designer. In this case it's a lot easier for me though to just duplicate the pages and have a page that is unique for each role. So now that I've got my Widgeru page set up, what I'm going to do is I'm going um, to copy this page and I'm going to um, paste it. And to get that menu, I just right-clicked on the page, copy, right-click, paste. So now I've got Widgeru page one. So let's fix that name. And let's call this one Fandangled. And uh, let's adjust our um, settings widget from instead of being price of Widgerus to be price for Fandangled. And adjust the title from Widgeru price to Fandangled price. Excellent. So now we've set up, um, well, the first part here. We still need to adjust our um, graph, though. Uh, we also need to adjust our button. So let's start by uh, adjusting our graph. So if we double click on our graph, um, our market share is fine. All of the companies are able to see each other's market share. That's a shared piece of information. But what isn't shared is the profit information. Fandangled shouldn't be able to see Widgeru's profit. Widgeru should be able to see Fandangled's profit. So we need to go fix that. And the easiest way to do that is just to delete Widgeru and Thingamabob off this graph. Let's adjust the line style to be solid. And now Fandangled's profit sits on its own. The final thing we need to adjust is this button. So I'm going to double click on this button and I'm going to slide over so that we can see it while I adjust. And I'm going to change the action from advanced time and ballistic mode to some of the multiplayer actions which live here on the bottom. So if you see here, I've got these four actions, ready to advance, cancel ready to advance, ready to start, cancel ready to start. And one of the most common forms for multiplayer games to advance time is what we call this consensus based time advancement technique. So in order for time to advance um, in a multiplayer game that we're building here, especially a competitive game, all the players need to agree that time is ready to go forward. So to signify that, we have an action called ready to advance. When each role signals that they are ready to advance, only after every role has signaled that they're ready to advance, will the game actually move forward in time. You can still set up a time advancement technique which is not consensus based, meaning one player has the power to advance time above all others. But to do that, you need to make sure that the advance time button is only visible 
for whatever player you want to have power to advance the simulation. So I, if I had left this simulation with an advanced time and ballistic mode option for both Widgeroo and Fandangled, what would happen would be a race. Whoever hit that button first would have their decision entered and the game moved forward in time. <laughs> so as you can see, that's not a behavior that we want um, in a competitive game. In competitive games, you want a consensus-based form of time advancement. Um, in some cooperative games, and I say some, um, you'll want a time advancement technique where one user, like for instance, the president, has the power to say, all decisions are final, we're going forward in time. All right, so that's my treatise on uh, ready to advance and time advancement technique. So let's go back uh, to the first page here and let's adjust this button to also be um, a ready to advance button. Um, let's also, while we're at it, um, adjust this graph to only show profit for Widgeroo. Excellent. All right, so now our Widgeroo page is set up. Our Fandangled page is set up. Um, what we need to do is set up our page uh, for thingamabob. And so I still have that old page on my clipboard, so I'm going to paste it one more time. And uh, what I'm going to do with this page is uh, I'm going to name it for the third company, thingamabob. Excellent. And we're going to make the same set of adjustments. We're going to change this button from advanced time in ballistic mode to be ready to advance. We're going to change this from price of Widgeroos to be price of thingamabob. I'm just going to use the green plus rather than trusting my typing skills. Excellent. And uh, we'll adjust this to say thingamabob. And so now we've got um, our input set up and our um, button set up. Let's just set up our profit graph. So let's remove Widgeroo and let's remove Fandangled and let's make it solid. And now we have each, each um, role having its own page. So let's go ahead and begin to set up some of the multiplayer options. To do that, we're going to use this new button in the interface settings panel to configure multiplayer options. This button brings up a dialog, which first describes, you know, um, all of the rules around free, excuse me, free multiplayer games. More or less, it says that they have to have two required roles. You know, you need two people to play a multiplayer game. And the number of variables multiplied by the number of DTs has to be less than 20,000. Um, and that metric is essentially how much um, storage space and computational um, resources are you using on our server. Obviously, we offer plans if your model um, breaks either one of those conditions. So let's enable multiplayer, and then let's go ahead and make some of the decisions here. The first one is whether or not we want chat. Um, so when we think about people playing a multiplayer game, they could be in the same room with each other. They could be spread out um, across the country, across the world. Um, they don't have to be sitting next to each other. So I like to include chat in my multiplayer games so that people can communicate with each other um, in order to make decisions. Then the next setting that we're looking at here is pause interval for multiplayer. And you'll say, yeah, Billy, what the heck is that? And well, what that is, is if you remember, in the advanced time in ballistic mode action, we were advancing uh, the simulation by two months at a time. Well, in order for the ready to advance action, to advance the simulation two months at a time, we need to tell it how many months to advance when everybody is ready to advance. And so that's what pause interval for multiplayer is. So for here, we'll specify two. Now, we need to go ahead and create our roles. So we'll use the green plus to add a new role. And the first role is going to be uh, called Widgeroo. And uh, its number is the number one. Don't worry about the numbers yet. And, uh, well, what page does Widgeroo start on? Widgeroo starts on the Widgeroo page. Now, we have this option called Variable. And this is a pretty neat little option because our multiplayer games have this concept of optional roles. Roles that may or may not be filled by um, actual human players when the game begins. 
And so, well, what happens if you have a role that isn't filled by a uh, by a human player? How are decisions made? How do you make a lifelike, you know, player? Well, you can write model logic to pretend, you know, to make what appear to be human decisions. So in order for you to be able to build this model logic, you need a variable within your model. Um, in this case, I've called the variable is active, which can be set to zero or one based upon whether or not a certain role is filled. So you can use an if statement to say, if, you know, is active withdrew, then set the price to the price that the user entered. Otherwise, set the price to a random number between zero and 10. This way, for players who aren't active, for roles which aren't actively filled, they're still doing something. They're not just a constant value. Um, and that's a really neat feature. Um, so we're going to use it. Um, and in this case, the Widgeroo role um, is required, so I'm going to leave that checkbox checked. So let's go ahead and create a new role for Fandangled. This is the second role. Um, this number must be unique. Um, this dialog takes care of making that number unique for you, so don't worry about it. Um, is active Fandangled, and uh, this role is required. The third required role is Thingamabob, and they start on the Thingamabob page, and their variable is is active Thingamabob, but this role is not required. So that means this game can be played with two or three players. And because the variable is active is being set, whether or not Thingamabob is playing the game, I've been able to write some model logic um, for the decisions that are made by Thingamabob um, so that they can appear as if they are made by a human. So now we hit OK, and we're done with this dialog for the time being. So now you'll see that I've got uh, what I call a hamburger button in the upper left-hand corner of the sim, and that is the button that people will use for chat. So now we've got our sim set up. Um, we've got the ability for all of the players when they um, log in and start the game to be directed to their individual player pages. But what we're missing is a debrief at the end of the game that lets all of the players see how everybody did and lets the players um, make a decision to start a new game. So to do that, I'm going to right click and paste that same page one more time. And I'm going to call this page the debrief page. Um, and the debrief page is going to show information, only outputs, um, on how every player did. So if we double click on this graph um, and we come to the profit section here, it's going to show you profit for all three companies. That way each player can see how each other player did. But rather than have um, this button advance time, what we're going to do is we're going to have this button mark the player is ready to start a new game. So if all the players hit the ready to start button, a new game will be um, started and all of the players will be pushed back onto their respective, um, you know, Widgeroo page or Fandangled page or Thingamabob page. But what we need to set up is the navigation that's going to push people from their individual pages into the debrief page. And to do that, we're going to use a simulation event, otherwise known as a poster. So I'm going to go to the interface settings panel, and I'm going to um, hover over the little speech bubble, which is the simulation events panel. And I'm going to hit the add event button. And in this variable, I've got, in this variable, excuse me, in this model, I have a variable called game over. Game over is either zero or one um, based upon if the game is going to be over or not in the next time step. So what I want to do is set up a simulation event with a threshold of a half. So when game over crosses from zero to one, it will trigger this tripwire. It will trigger this event. And I want it to do, um, to do this only once per run. And I want it to do the following action. If the run was started via the interface window, and make sure that this event applies for everybody, not just Widgeroo or Fandangled or Thingamabob, um, display the message and go to a page debrief. 
So now we've set up a simulation event, which is going to be triggered when the game is over, which is going to push people from their individual game pages into their debrief page. So let's save our work, which I'm going to do using Control S, and then let's publish it and begin our testing process. So let's do File, Publish, and this is going to open up uh, the IC Exchange. And uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to log in here. Okay, and I'm going to add a new simulation, and this simulation is going to be um, Price War um, from the webinar. And I could describe it or give it keywords and things like that if I was uh, interested in getting this sim to appear higher in the rankings. Um, but I'm not at the moment. So I'm just going to agree to license my content under the Creative Commons. Um, this is a required step um, for free multiplayer game hosting. Of course, uh, if you don't want to license your content under the Creative Commons, we do offer pay for options, which allow you to skirt that requirement. And we're going to add the simulation and then we're going to upload it. And now we can navigate to our sim. Here's Price War from the webinar and I can hit the view link and we can see here that uh, I'm able to look at the sim. I can take this link. I'm going to copy it using control C. I'm going to come to Chrome here and I'm going to paste it using control V. And we can see here that the sim is visible. Here it's prompting me for a nickname, whereas on the other page it already knew who I was because I was logged in. So in this case, I'm going to give myself a nickname, Billy. I'm going to hit continue. And you see here that I get to this page that says, choose a game to join. Well, isn't it a bit annoying that this box covers up our nice title that we made? I think so. So why don't we go adjust um, this box to fit within the content size that we've made available? To do that, um, what we're going to do is we're going to go back into Architect. We're going to close this page out here. And what we're going to do is we're going to go back into the multiplayer options and scroll down um, to these game setup pages options down here. So this is what the game setup page is, that content that you get to before the game actually begins. And so as a template, we're going to use the template that we made. And what we're going to do is rather than start all the way um, at the left, um, we'll start 20 pixels from the left. We'll start 20 pixels from the right. We'll start 100 pixels from the top and 20 pixels from the bottom. That way, our box will be a lot more centered on the page. So now I'm going to hit File, Publish. And I'm going to scroll down to Price War from the webinar. I'm going to hit Update Interface. And it automatically updates uh, my interface. And when this dialog box is gone, I can come back to Chrome here. And I'm just going to refresh the page. And I'm going to enter Billy. And now we see that we got the box to fit a heck of a lot nicer. Now we can actually go ahead and create our game. So this game, because nobody's playing it yet, doesn't have any active um, games for anybody to join. So I need to create the game that other people will join. So I'm going to enter a name for my game called Play My Cool Game. And it brings me to this role assignment page. So here it's telling me I am Widgeroo, and Widgeroo is required. I can click on Fandangled. Now I'm Fandangled, which is required. Or I can be Thingamabob, which is optional. I'm going to stick as Widgeroo. And I'm going to mark myself as ready to start. I'm going to take this, and I'm going to copy it. And I'm going to see if I have Firefox on this computer. I do. And I'm going to open up Firefox. And so when testing multiplayer games, it's really useful um, to use two browsers. The reason why you want to use two browsers um, rather than individual tabs is so that if you want to restore a game, um, you can do that. Um, you can test multiplayer games. Um, all in multiple tabs of the same browser, but then you're going to be the same person as every role, um, which is kind of confusing. So I'm going to use um, Firefox here. And I'm going to come to this uh, game page. And um, 
what I'm going to do once it loads here, give it a second. is I'm going to enter my name here as Billy from Firefox. And you'll see here, my game is ready for me to join, so I'm going to join it. And it uh, looks like some uh, participants has actually joined this, uh, this game as well. Um, so if whoever that is, uh, if you could please leave so that I could uh, demonstrate the game, I'd really appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, and so I'm going to join in here. I'm going to mark myself as ready to start. <laughs> and over here, I was ready to start. And so now the game um, has begun. So now what I can do is uh, I can enter in a price. So I'm going to enter in a price of, you know, $20. And I'm going to say ready. Um, for some reason, my connection has been interrupted. I have been, um, I will just refresh and reconnect. We'll just okay. Where was I? I was also in Firefox. Okay, the game has started. Um, I'm ready to advance, and I'm ready to advance. And when both players are ready to advance, the game moves forward. Ready to advance, and if I come back uh, to Firefox over here, and I say ready, the game um, continues to move forward. So Fandangled is able to see um, Fandangled's profit. Um, they're able to see everybody's market share. Um, and if I come back here to uh, Chrome, we can see that Widrew is able to see Widrew's profit and everybody's market share. And if I start making uh, decisions, um, we'll eventually reach the end of the game. And we'll see that uh, poster trigger, which brings us to the debrief. Now you know why I only wanted this game to go six rounds. It takes a while during testing to hit the button lots of times. So congratulations, the game is over. Let's review how everybody did. We see here that uh, we've got three different profit scores for Ridgeru, Fandangled, and Thingamabob. And we have three unique market shares. So with that, um, let's go back um, to PowerPoint. And uh, let's open the floor to any questions. Oh, yeah. Before I do that, I just want to mention uh, that we've got uh, some upcoming webinars uh, in November. We're doing a series, um, a pay-for series, a lecture series, all about uh, interactive learning environments, design, and theory. Um, so it'll be less how-to like these webinars are, but more about how you design your interfaces to align with the learning goals that you're trying to accomplish. And then in December, we'll pick up um, with more of these free how-to webinars all around authentication and data collection. So at this point, I'd like uh, to turn the floor over to Hillary, who can uh, ask me some of the questions. Hi, Billy. Thanks. One of the questions we have right now is, is it possible to make games with 20 to 30 people like a classroom simulation, or is it best for fewer people? You can do um, giant games like that. Um, the system will support it, um, but my suggestion um, tends to be to go with smaller groups. Um, you'll tend um, to get a much more interesting experience because um, the players will actually be able to communicate with each other um, and make decisions as a team. Um, also, when you've got uh, such a large group like that, um, people tend to, uh, you know, to get lost in the machinery. So for more of a pedagogical reason as opposed to technological reasons, um, I would suggest going with smaller team sizes. Um, and I would say if reasonable um, to go no more than six. 
Great. Another question is, um, can you explain a little bit more on the subscripting section? Sure. Um, so I'm going to cover arrays just a little bit here. Um, and if you're interested um, in arrays um, in more depth, um, I think we have some webinars uh, that Kareem Shashakli has done in the past which cover that. Um, but what we've got going on here is uh, a concept called arrays. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you the very, very quick demonstration. So I'm going to make a new model here. I'm going to make a variable called price. Um, and I'm going to set uh, the price uh, here to be $8. Um, and so if I wanted to make this uh, for three different companies, I could take price and I could copy it, paste it, paste it. And that's, you know, for the first company and the second company. What arrays allow us to do is get away from copying and pasting things, um, but to actually use the power of the software to take care of duplicating stuff for us. So I'm going to delete those two copies. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the array editor and I'm going to create a new dimension and we'll call it company. And in this case, we'll have three companies. And what I can do is to the price variable, I can go to the array tab and add the company dimension. And so now, you'll see the symbol has changed. Instead of being, you know, a single converter, it actually looks stacked, like there are many of them sitting there. And in fact, there are. So now this is saying, um, what is the price? This is the price for this company. And so if I were to uncheck apply to all, there's two forms of array equations, apply to all, where the value um, in this box applies to each and every company in the list, or when I uncheck not apply to all, which is there is an equation for each and every individual element. So the first company's price is eight, the second one's price is nine, the third one's price is 10. And so doing it like that lets me copy and paste variables without having to you know, copy and paste variables. It makes it a lot easier um, to make more compact models um, and to adjust my models as I add more companies or take away companies. You'll find that a lot of the equations you write um, are actually the same for every um, individual array element as opposed to the non-apply to all equation that I just demonstrated. Um, and like I was saying, if you're uh, interested uh, in arrays, uh, we do have webinar content uh, which covers that topic. Yeah, Billy, that's interesting. Problem one, if anyone is interested. Awesome. And that's uh, Intro to Modeling 1 for people who had trouble um, here in Korea. Uh, no, that was Intermediate, Billy. Oh, Intermediate <laughs> Modeling 1. See, I was having trouble here in Korea, so that's why I repeated it. Thank you very much. Hillary? Uh, another question we're actually getting is, will the resources be available? Are you going to post the model anywhere? Uh, certainly. Um, we can make uh, the model as well as a recording of this webinar available um, uh, through our uh, website. Great. One more question. I see the simulation you did about pricing on companies. Could you adapt to make simulations for the use of natural resources using pricing and time? Certainly. Um, so in this case, I just built a kind of random model um, all about, um, you know, just a simple bidding market. Um, so the models that you build can be about any subject that you're interested in. You know, you could build models um, about uh, businesses, about, uh, you know, intra, so inside of cells. Um, you could build models um, about... Uh, really anything your heart desires. So we use the system dynamics methodology, that's the modeling methodology that underlies all of this, um, to represent um, any process that we see in the world. Um, and there's a whole um, field actually devoted to the uh, creation of these models. Um, and you can go as high as to get postgraduate degrees uh, within this field. So if you're interested in learning more about building models, um, checking out our website and some of uh, our previous webinar content um, around building models, especially some of the webinars done by uh, Kareem, um, you'll find a wealth of information and knowledge um, to begin to get you started. Great, Billy, that's all the questions we have right now. Excellent. Unless someone else wants to add some more questions in.
so then uh, I'll, uh, unless we see others coming in, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say uh, thank you all uh, for coming and spending uh, an hour with me, either this afternoon or this morning uh, or this evening, depending upon where you're at. And uh, I really uh, enjoy your company. And as always, don't be afraid uh, to send any questions. And uh, for those of you who sign up uh, for the November uh, paid webinar series, I'll see you in a few weeks. Um, otherwise, uh, I hope to see you in uh, December. Thanks very much. Bye-bye.